Okay, um, nice to see you all again. Hope you had a good week. Um, today we're going to leave logic and argument behind, or rather we're not actually, because you can't, you can't get away from logic and argument in philosophy. Um, I'm going to talk about ethics and politics. Um, so you might not, it won't sound quite as uh, foreign to you today, perhaps. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about three ethical theories. I'm, uh, obviously, I, I've chosen three because I could have talked about all, all number of things. Um, but these three are probably the, the three most popular theories. Uh, firstly, Aristotle and his what has become virtue ethics now. Um, then I'm going to talk about Kant, and then I'm going to talk about utilitarianism. And I'll uh, compare and contrast them to each other, but I hope by the end of today you'll at least have a feel for some of the key issues of each of these um, theories. Okay, so we're going to start with Aristotle. Now, tell me, actually, before I go on to Aristotle, what, what is it that we're trying to answer when, in ethics, when we're trying to do ethics? What do you think the question is that we're concerned with? Right or wrong? Yeah. That's not a question. I mean, yes, we're concerned with right or wrong, but what is the question to so which... Well, it's, it's morally right to do something. Right, okay. One question might be, is it right to do whatever? Um, to lie, to kill, to whatever. That might be a question. Good. That, that's right. Um, there are two sorts of ethical question. Uh, you can't hear my answer. No, sorry, you can't hear the question. Oh, their answers. Got it. Okay. The first answer was, um, the question we're looking to answer is, uh, is doing this right or wrong? And the second answer was the principles behind. What are the principles behind decisions about right or wrong? Is that fair? The count of what you said. Okay, um, and between the two of you, you've come up with absolutely the distinction that I want to come up with. Thank you very much. Um, the distinction between first order ethics and second order ethics. Now, first order ethics looks at the world. It looks at certain action types, lying, killing, cloning, whatever. And it says, is an action of this type morally acceptable? Okay, that's a first order question because it pertains to the world, if you like. Then there are second order moral questions which ask, what is it that makes an action right or wrong? Do you see that we've gone one back, if you like? So just in the same way, if I talk about first order beliefs, I'm talking about beliefs about the world. So my belief that chair's blue is a first order belief. But if I then think, is my belief that that chair's blue <coughs> true? That's a second order belief because it's a belief about a belief. Got it? So, and you can have second order desires as well. Does someone want to give me a, a first order desire? What's a first order desire? Uh, or I, I, want a, I want a cream cake or I want something to eat or, or whatever. Um, and a second order desire? It's a bit more difficult, actually, with desires. I realise now I've started. I'll finish. <laughs> Can anyone think of a second order desire? I want one. Very nearly. Yeah, absolutely. You might think, OK, I want a cream cake, but I want to be slim. Both of those first order desires. But then you might think, I want to be the sort of person who wants a salad rather than a cream cake. Or I want to be the sort of person who wants my health more than I want a cigarette, or something like that. So you should be noticing, incidentally, that the philosophy works in the second order. So is that belief true is a, is a very philosophical question, or what, does, what is truth, what constitutes truth, what constitutes rightness? So, okay, we can say whether cloning's right, or killing's right, or keeping promises is right, but as a philosopher, what we're interested in is, what is it for something to be right? <coughs> what is it for an action to be right? What is it for an action to be wrong? Okay, we step back a bit. Um, so, what we're interested in today is not so much first-order ethics, but second-order ethics, or meta-ethics, it's sometimes called. 
We're interested not so much in judgments about particular types of action. We're interested in judgments about that sort of judgment, what it is that makes something right. Now, very importantly, you can only test your second order ethical theories against your first order ethical <coughs> theories. So if an ethical theory says, well, what it is for an action to be right is this, it would be perfectly reasonable to say, well, there's one problem with that, and it comes out, and the problem is that it comes out of saying that it's fine to kill people. Uh, now, that's a, because it clashes with the first order ethics, you think there's probably something wrong with your second order ethics. Do you see what I mean? You, you test the two against each other. As in everything, theory and practice interact with each other. So to link this to last week, um, when, we were, when I was doing logic, I said to you quite a few times, you are all rational animals. You all make um, logical decisions, logical judgments the whole time, because whenever you uh, decide whether an argument is good or bad, you're making a logical decision. Um, the difference between us is that I know what I'm doing when I do that, whereas you do it just from instinct, from intuition. But what a logician does is identify what you do when you reason and then formulate a theory on that. But of course, if that theory came out telling you to do something that you think is blindingly obviously wrong, all of you do, then there's something wrong with the ethical theory. So theory and practice interact. You, you test your intuitions about ethical theory against your ordinary, everyday ethical judgments. We're going to be doing a bit of that today, so I'll draw your attention to the fact that we're doing it when we do it, so you'll see what I mean when I, when I, what I'm saying now. Okay, so we're going to talk first about Aristotle. And now Aristotle, I've given you his dates there, um, says that the right action is the action that would be chosen by a virtuous person. Now, you feel like saying, not very useful, Aristotle. Um, not a good decision-making theory, this one, because I've now got to know who's a virtuous person and, and ask them and make sure I understand them and so on. But anyway, that's what Aristotle says. The right action is the, the action that would be chosen by a virtuous person. And... What is a virtuous person? Well, here we are. A virtuous person knows three things, uh, or at least uh, has three characteristics. The first is he or she knows which is the right action in a situation. Now, this is quite an important um, feature of Aristotelianism. Aristotle believes that morality has nothing to do with rules, rules like keep promises, don't tell lies, etc., and let me give you a, an example of that. Okay, I want you to imagine a situation. Okay, uh, your mum comes back from the hairdresser, or your wife, or your husband, or your daughter, or whoever you like, uh, comes back from the hairdresser and says, what do you think? And you think, yuck. Okay, you've got a problem, haven't you? What, what's your problem? The truth isn't a problem, it's a word. Tell me what the problem is. You might hurt the person, okay, that's one element, what, but that's only one side because that's not a problem. Uh, you might have to lie, you're not going to have to lie. You've got a choice, haven't you? You might be wrong. You, <laughs> well, if you think yuck, you can't be wrong about what you think, at least. And that, Your mum has asked you, what do you think? So, okay, you've got a problem here. There are two rules, aren't there? Be kind, be honest. And it looks as if in this situation you've got a conflict. You can't be both kind and honest. Right, so what do you do? <laughs> okay, well, Aristotle says this is a classic example of a moral dilemma. You cannot use rules here because the rules run out. The thing about rules is that their general claims, don't lie, don't kill, that have to be applied in particular situations. And given that, in various particular situations, they're going to come into conflict, aren't they? And so, in this time, you're thinking, my goodness, if I tell her what the truth, she's going to think I'm really cruel. If I tell her a lie, I'm going to think I'm really awful. And what do you do? So you've, you've got to make a choice between these two. Does it 
it change your mind if I say your mum's been uh, depressed for six months? This is the first time you've seen her smile. Does that push you in one direction? Okay. No, I thought that before. <laughs> you thought that before? <laughs> oh, I see. You thought you'd be kind before. Be kind. Okay. Well, okay. I, I'm going to embarrass some of you now because. Um, <coughs> What you'll do if you're not a proper moral agent in this situation is make yourself a set of rules. You're going to say, oh, goodness, I can't bear this sort of moral dilemma. I, you know, I really, I don't want to be cruel and I don't want to be dishonest either. What am I going to do? I'll just have to say, look, in this, I, I value truth more than I value um, being kind. So whenever this situation arises, whenever I hit a dilemma of this kind, I'm going to be honest. Now, we all know people like that, don't we? Some of you may be people like that. Okay? And there are other people who hit that situation, and they say, oh, I hate this sort of dilemma. I'm going to make myself a little rule. And the rule is, whenever I hit a situation of this kind, I'm going to be kind. I think kindness trumps honesty and I'm going to be kind, perhaps you're... <laughs> Usually. Yeah, okay. But you see, that if you make that sort of... We all know that sort of person too, don't we? Aristotle says that you shouldn't be a person of either of those kinds, because what you should do is maintain the value of both truth and honesty and make a decision in this particular situation that doesn't necessarily have any ramification whatsoever for any other situation. So you don't make a rule that says, I value truth more than honesty, or I value honesty more than truth. You say, in this situation, given the particularities of the whole situation, I'm going to go for kindness, given that my mum's been depressed for so long, um, etc. But in another situation, pretty much the same. You'd say, I'm going to go to for honesty. And the point, according to Aristotle, is you don't make yourself rules. You just do whatever seems to you in that situation to be the right thing to do. Um, surely, the problem is probably negating your question, but surely the problem is that the mother should never have actually said, what do you think? Because I've never in a million years said to my daughter, what do you think? Well, I'm glad you wouldn't, but many other people would. <laughs> And, and if you didn't say it, you thought, what about, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> or, you know, what do you think of this dress? Or did you like the stew I made tonight? Or, I mean, we're constantly seeking the opinions of others on, on things and, and therefore putting them potentially into that situation of moral dilemma. So, and anyway, the fact is, this, you can generalise the example I'm using. The example I'm using is fairly trivial. Uh, but any moral dilemma is exactly this situation. You've got two values two general rules which in a particular situation come into conflict and you can't obey both. Of course you're going to wriggle, aren't you? Yes. I'm going to be cruel to be kind, you're going to say, or something like that. Or of course it's not really a lie, it's only a white lie. Okay, well, did you both try, did you try that before you gave your answer? Yeah, I'm sure you did. Because one of the things about being a virtuous person is that you've got to be a wise person, says Aristotle. He thinks that all the virtues come together. Um, and the thing about a wise and virtuous person is that they do know what to do in a situation. Unfortunately, not in a way that they can give you a rule. Okay? All they can do is... is well, they can't do anything because they're, they're likely to be modest as well, of course. But if you think they're virtuous, you should watch them see what they do, try, try and intuitively act as they would act. Ask yourself, how would they act in this situation, that sort of thing. So he knows what the right action is, even though knowing what the right action is is so very difficult, and there aren't any rules that you can give to anyone that are going to help them. The second thing about the virtuous person is that he performs the right action. Well, we all know about this, don't we? <laughs> you know, you know what the right thing is to do, but do you do it? Oh, you know, there you went again. You gave in for temp to temptation. Okay, you needn't be malicious or, or something like that. It could be just a moment of weakness or whatever. Um, clearly, knowing what the right action is is not a sufficient reason for being, uh, not a sufficient condition of being virtuous. You've actually got to do the right action as well. 
And Aristotle says that the thing about the virtuous person is that, um, and this is actually very important here, uh, you can be born benevolent, okay? You're, you're a sort of naturally benevolent person. Um, but that doesn't be, mean that you're going to acquire the virtue of benevolence. <coughs> a, a comparison here is you could be born strong with the potential to be a real athlete or something like that. But if you sit around eating crisps and watching television all day, um, this disposition is going to disappear, isn't it? So you were born with the potential to be strong, but you're not strong. Born with the potential to be athletic, but you're not athletic. Similarly, you might be born with the potential to be virtuous, to be benevolent, say, but not be benevolent. And the difference is that you actually have to exercise benevolence. You have to do it. So if you're born strong, you actually have to exercise, you have to practice, you have to train. If you do all those things, you will become strong, properly strong. Similarly, um, it doesn't matter whether you've been born benevolent, so you occasionally do kind things just because it's your nature. To Aristotle, you've actually got to do it because it is the right thing to do, and you've got to practice. You've got to get the habit of telling the truth. We all know, don't we, that the first lie is quite difficult, but the second one's a bit easier, and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. You know, you can get the habit of being dishonest, you can get the habit of, of not fulfilling your intentions of going swimming this afternoon, that was a little reminder to me. Um, you've got to try and get the good habits, the habits the other way round. Um, so you've not only got to know what the right action is, you've actually got to act on that knowledge. And what's more, make it a habit of acting on that knowledge. Okay? Um, and finally, you've got to perform the right action for the right reason. Okay, now each of us is the guardian of our own morality, if you like, of our own values. Imagine the situation again with your mum. Um, okay, here, here's the situation. She said, what do you think? And you've made a, you think, yuck! and you make a lightning decision, I'm going to be kind here. Now, you can justify that, can't you? It's, you know, it's very easy to say, I, I was just being kind. You can also justify, I was just being honest. But we all know that sometimes, when we were honest, actually what we did was give in to a moment's spite. Have we ever done that? Don't need to admit. Don't put, I won't ask you to put your hands up. <laughs> um, so you can, you can claim to be being honest, but actually you're giving in to a moment's spite. And similarly, you can claim to be being kind, but actually you've just failed in moral courage. Is that also a common situation? So it's no good just knowing what the right action is and performing the right action. You've got to perform the right action for the right reason. Okay, so one's intention is, is very important to Aristotle. And if throughout a lifetime you do these things, I mean, obviously you get better as you get older and, and so on. Um, if throughout a lifetime you do these things, you will become a virtuous person. And at that point, um, <coughs> you can be looked to as someone whose actions to emulate, someone's decisions to emulate, somebody whose advice to ask and so on. So, for example, when the government gets together a, a group of the great and the good to form an advisory committee or something like that, what the government is doing is actually acting in a very Aristotelian sense. They're saying, look, all you lot, you're, you're wise and virtuous, so let's put you together and ask your advice on these issues. Let's see what you would do or what you would tell us to do. Um, and that's uh, what we're doing is consulting people who have a reputation who have proven themselves in some sphere of life to, to have acted virtuously. Okay, that's Aristotle then. <laughs> yes, I was just going to say, are there any questions? Yeah, firstly, he seems to have added an unnecessary layer of complexity with this business about having to find a virtuous person. Why is that an unnecessary layer of complexity? Because surely it's sufficient 
sufficient to look at those three conditions. And some people may have them in some situations, may apply them in some situations and not others. It's not just a sort of black or white thing. Aristotle would think it does it. This person's not virtuous, doesn't. Mm -hmm. And sort of ally to that, there's, there's the issue of like the right action. It presupposes that every situation there is a right action. No, it doesn't. That's the pros yeah. and cons. No, it, it doesn't presuppose, I'll, I'll deal with that one first because it's very easy, it doesn't presuppose that there is a right action. As a matter of fact, in the situation I gave you with your mum, mm. either of those actions could be right, and it would be perfectly reasonable for you to make either of those decisions mm. if you were sincerely making them on, on your best judgment. Yeah. Um, so the fact is there can be many different right answers, but that doesn't mean there isn't a wrong one. Do you see what I mean? I mean, there are lots of different right answers in the situation. doesn't mean there isn't a wrong one. Um, on the first one, I don't think it's a layer of complexity because if I have a moral dilemma, if I have a problem um, that I think is a moral one, um, I'll go and ask lots of different people, but I'm not going to ask anyone I think is either stupid or um, <coughs> wicked or... Um, likely to give me biased advice or something like that. The people I'll choose will be people I think can give me something to say. And of course I'm not going to choose just one, I'm going to choose several. Um, and I don't see why that shouldn't be described as looking for a virtuous person to help me out in this situation. Of course the decision is eventually mine, but I think I'd be stupid not to go seeking advice. I would have just thought it's hard enough making the decision in some situations where it's complex, it's hard enough knowing what's the right action and doing it for the right reasons without having to then make decisions, I mean, in order to get there, to make decisions about which person's virtuous in this respect and which person isn't. But I think you're getting it the wrong way around because it seems to me that when I have a moral dilemma, what I usually mean by that is I don't know what the right action is in this situation. Mm -hmm. Or I can give arguments for several different actions, yeah. and it might be that any one of them would be right. And that's why I would seek the opinion of somebody else whom I respected. I guess, I mean, I, my probable response there, in fact, my response is to think about it and weigh up the pros and cons myself and look at the reasons for... You, would, you wouldn't consult anyone else? It depends, it depends on the situation, not necessarily, no. Right, well, I, um, you know, that, that's a personal anecdote. What Aristotle would say is that what you should do is, is you might not consult them, but you might say, what would so-and-so do in this situation? What would so-and-so do in this situation? Um, anyway, you don't have to agree with Aristotle, yeah. but this is his theory. I mean... Uh, I do agree with Aristotle here. I, I would certainly, I wouldn't make a serious moral decision where I wasn't sure of the pros and cons myself without asking some other people. Then, of course, I'd weigh the pros and cons for myself because eventually the decision must be yours, mustn't it? Um, you know, you, you can't get away from weighing the pros and cons, but you can either do it without advice or, or you can take advice from people whom you respect and admire. Okay, any other questions about Aristotle? What's the trivial question? Um, what do you think of my hair? What do you think of my hair? <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, that's trivial. What are you going to vote? You know, you've got, you, you ask somebody, shall we say, um, who, who's a great friend of yours, and you say to them, uh, are you going to vote for X or are you going to vote for X? Vote for y? Um, and she says, oh, I'm certainly going to vote for X. And then you're then you knew find yourself because you know you're going to go one way. And are you going to have a problem where you support um, your friend or you're going to um, argue with her about it? Well, I, I mean, I, I would suggest that you argue with her first and maybe support her or, or not support her, depending on how the argument went. Yes. But I would also say that you should invite, ask someone else. And the key question is, why are you going to vote for X? And, and you ask someone else, why are you going to vote for Y? I mean, there, I use the trivial question as an example, but as I said, it, it applies in every case of moral dilemma. 
I mean, should we allow uh, cybrids, for example, the, these, um, uh, the use of um, a cow egg to incubate a human nucleus, producing something that's 99% human, 1% uh, bovine. Um, I mean, should we do that? Is that morally acceptable? Well, you know, I could just weigh the pros and cons by myself, um, or I could ask just one friend, or, or, but I think what I would do is ask lots of people. I would set up a commission to look into it, get lots of people on this commission who, are, who have a reputation for being wise, and I'd ask them to discuss it, and then weigh the pros and cons on the basis of this. So the question, it doesn't matter how trivial or important the question is, it's, it brings up the same process, which is that you, you consult as many virtuous people as possible and then weigh up the situation for yourself. Your problem often is... Sorry, sorry, I'll... Uh, right. um, yeah. uh, the problem I have with virtuous person is that it implies that somebody is virtuous all the time, whereas in this instance, if the person is only virtuous for this particular event, if it's been non-virtuous, Else. No, it, Aristotle wouldn't think that was the case. It, what he, you don't become virtuous until you've been um, performing the right action for the right reason on many occasions in the past. I mean, we can all get it wrong occasionally, but we all know that there are some people who get it wrong a lot. Um, you know, they either never know what the right... They, you know, you think, well, he's a car crash waiting to happen, isn't he, this one? Um, or they know what the right action is but never perform it, you know, they're weak or malevolent or something, um, or they do perform the right action. So, I mean, for example, if I'm, an honest, uh, if I'm a dishonest person, my best bet is to tell the truth, isn't it, most of the time? Um, what a dishonest person does is merely hold themselves ready to be dishonest when it's going to benefit them. They, I mean, actually, it's, it's important if I want to be dishonest to get you to trust me. Um, but if what I'm doing is telling the truth, I, I know that telling the truth is the right thing to do, I'm, I'm often telling the truth, but the reason I'm doing it is to get you to trust me so I can then sell you that nice timeshare that I've, you know, sadly just sprang a leak the other day or whatever, then, then I'm doing it for the wrong reason. So it's not in a situation that, you, that someone is virtuous. If they're virtuous, says Aristotle, they have been virtuous over a, a long period. The nice thing is, you, you can't really be virtuous till you're quite old. I mean, we all, we all qualify. We, we've either made it by now or we're having. Uh, no, so a virtuous person is always virtuous then? No, we can all make mistakes. Um, you know, no, nobody's denying that, that you can make mistakes. Um, but, but the thing is, and, and you know, it's, this is not a foolproof procedure because. You know, you can get the great... I mean, Mary Warnock came out recently and said she made the wrong decision on special schools. I mean, she's a prime example of the sort of person the government consults when it comes to wanting a virtuous person. Well, she's come out and said she believed she was wrong on something. You know, that, that's entirely consistent with being a virtuous person. Uh, but if someone did it too often, then, then you'd stop consulting them, wouldn't you? We're spending too long on Aristotle, so just one quick question. It, well, it makes them more virtuous, yes, certainly it, it suggests that something, something's going <laughs> right there. Yeah. Okay, so that's Aristotle. Um, so you've got one ethical theory now, one account of what it is, uh, what the right action is. The right action is one that's performed by a virtuous person or chosen by a virtuous person. Not very action-guiding, but a good theory, I think. Okay, here's another one. Kant believes that an action is right only if the person performing it does so out of reverence <coughs> for the law, or as he would also put it, out of a sense of duty. Um, but in duty here, you've got to be quite careful because we have a tendency to think of duty as something dry and horrible, um, whereas Kant doesn't think of it like that. Um, let me leave that for a second. I'll just, um, Kant talks about... Uh, in the groundwork of the metaphysic of morals, which is on your reading list. He talks about uh, the only way you can tell whether someone's virtuous or not is if, uh, in a situation of moral dilemma, 
they're prepared to act out of duty rather than inclination. Okay, so we always have many motives for doing all, almost everything we do, there are several different motives. There are reasons for doing it, reasons for not doing it, and some reasons are better than others. Um, and if we act on the right reasons, so Kant is very similar to um, Aristotle in this, he thinks it's intention that's important. Um, it's acting out of reverence for the law, out of duty. So let's say, um, okay, we've got, I'm coming from one end of Bray's Nose Lane and you're coming from the other. What's your name? Alison. Alison's coming from the other. Uh, the beggar who sits there with her young child in winter, wrapped up at least, um, is asking for money. And Alison gives her a pound and I give her a pound. So we, we, exactly the right action. Um, Alison gave her a pound because um, she thought it was the right thing to do. I gave her a pound because I wanted Alison to think I'm a kind person. <laughs> okay. Have we both acted morally or have I acted morally? And Alison's acted in self-interest, or did I get that the wrong way around? You know what I mean. Just a little test for you. Make sure you're listening. Who, who thinks that um, I have acted just as morally as Alison? Okay, why? Because in the end, she's acted in self-interest because she wants to make herself feel good as well. Ah. <laughs> well, why do you... Why, why um, sorry, um, what's your name? Georgia. Georgia is saying that Alison did it as well because she wanted to make herself feel good. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that sounds a bit Yeah, I think in the end anything's done because usually it's just something. You think everything is done? Mostly, yeah. Okay. Even um, if it's done for good reasons, it's still there's self interest involved because you're making yourself feel okay. like you're doing the right thing. Can, you're in good company here. Hume, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, would say the same thing that everything is performed out of self-interest, that you do absolutely nothing out of um, altruism. Um, Kant thinks that that is absolutely wrong. Um, he thinks that if you do something out of inclination, then it's not, that he, by inclination he means for self-interest at any level, um, then it's not a moral action. And he actually thinks that, that most of the actions we do and, and people think they're moral are in fact not moral because they are done from this idea of wanting to appear good or, you know, you give something to charity and it gives you a nice warm glow and, you know, isn't is that a nice feeling? Well, if you do it for that reason, then it's not a moral action, says Kant. It's only a moral action if you perform it because you think it's the right thing to do. And, and the real test is, if there's, there's an action that you really, really, really want not to perform, and yet your duty tells you you should perform it, so you believe it's the right thing to do, if you <coughs> don't do the right thing, rather than what you want to do, you are acting morally in that particular instance. Whereas if you give in to your inclination, you're not acting morally. That's so Kant would disagree with you on the belief that every action is self-interested. He thinks most actions are self-interested, but not all of them. There are the occasional acts that is performed out of reverence for the law. Does that undermine religion? Well, Kant wouldn't care, wouldn't care about that. No. <laughs> Well, I, there are very few philosophers who care about that. And not because they're not religious, but... I'm sorry, go on. I'm Is that because you want to go to heaven or you want to have another aversion? And you want to have another aversion? And doesn't that then what I'm going to do? Um... I see. Because you, you're saying to the extent that religion gives you a an inclination towards performing the right thing. Okay, this is what Kant would say. This will remind you of something I said last week. In fact, it's exactly the same as something I said last week. Um, uh, okay, doing A is right, I should do A. Okay, and do you remember I said that Kant would say that that is entailed by that. You don't need in here anything like, I want to do the right thing. 
Now, in effect, Georgia, this is, this is what you're saying, that there must always be a desire of that kind in between this premise and this conclusion. And Kant would say, well, no, because actually, if you think you need to add in that you want to do the right thing, you're implying that there might be an occasion on which you didn't want to do the right thing. And if that's true, you don't have the concept of right at all. You don't understand what right is if on an occasion you might not want to do it. Do you see how it would work? So you don't, the very important thing here is that um, this, without the want here, is what uh, Kant would call a categorical imperative. The imperative, I should do A, is not contingent upon your having this desire <coughs> about doing the right thing, because this desire doesn't make any sense. <coughs> because if you know what it is to do right, you couldn't not want to do right. Doesn't mean that you will always do right, because we do quite often do things that, that we don't want to do, but the fact that we believe we were wrong will be manifested in shame and guilt. So you, if you really know what doing right and doing wrong is, you cannot want to do wrong. That's what Kant says. So, um, okay, so there's a very um, long tradition stemming from Hume that says um, you can't do any action without a self-interest behind it. Now, if that's so, and if Aristotle is right, so the ancients believe that, that actually <coughs> it has to be reason, not desire, that's drawing, um, propelling uh, moral actions, it would mean that actually none of our actions is moral wouldn't it? Because not one of them is, is altruistic. Um, so can, uh, sorry, Hume has to come up with another account of morality that's consistent with no actions being altruistic. Anyway, so that's Kant. And I've talked about doing it out of reverence for the law. So what is this moral law? Okay, well this, um, actually uh, Kant gives six different um, accounts of the categorical imperative of which this is one, um, and I'll give you this one because I like this one best, but there are six others, but they're supposed to be equivalent, so it shouldn't really matter that I'm giving you one rather than six. Uh, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, always at the same time uh, as an end and never solely as a means. So, what's your name? Dorothy, lend me your pen for a second. Thank you. Now, I used Dorothy as a means to my end then, didn't I? I wanted to, to uh, tell you something, to show you something. Uh, I asked her to give, my pen, she, give me her pen, she gave it to me. Uh, so she was a means to my end of giving you an example, is that right? But I also, at the same time, you can have it back now, <laughs> used her as an end in herself because she could have said no. She could have said, I'm sorry, I'm using it or it's the only pen I've got, or no, why should I lend you my pen? Or, you know, she had the choice. Actually, it's not true, is it, really, in this? <laughs> but you can see what I mean. Um, I did use her as means, and we're always using each other as means. When we say, pass the salt, would you carry my suitcase? You know, will you do this for me, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, what's important is that we always treat others as, as ends in themselves as well. In other words, we allow them to make their own choices if I trick you into carrying my suitcase, then I'm not treating you as an end in yourself because I'm not giving you the choice, am I? Um, so what Kant says is that you've always got to treat humanity um, as an end in themselves because the thing about humans, and he allows that there may be other rational animals, but, but let's just talk about humans. The thing about humans is they're rational. They make choices and they make them freely. Not all our choices are free, but some of them are. And the fact we can make free choices is what makes us moral animals. Okay, it's that that makes us moral. And notice it's not just the other people we've got to treat as uh, ends in themselves, it's also ourselves. 
You're every bit as wicked if you treat yourself as nothing more than the means to somebody else's end, um, because that's conflicting with your integrity as an autonomous being, as, as somebody with free will. Um, so that's the moral law. Um, notice, incidentally, that Kant is also pretty lousy as a decision maker. Okay, what's the right action? Oh, it, well, it's the one that the law says we should perform. What's the law? It's the one that says we should always treat others as ends. A lousy school rule, isn't it? You know, please treat others as ends at every time. Uh, and why, I, why does he bring time into it? Um, does he? Always at the same time. Oh, just say, as you treat them as a means, you're also treating them as an end. Oh. So, so it doesn't mean, I mean, it's not, there's no duration to it. Oh, right. um, it's just that simultaneously, you, you can't make up for having treated someone as a means by then treating them as an end. Mm -hmm. You were wrong to treat them as a means in the first place. <coughs> okay, so that's Kant. <laughs> we're rollicking through the um, philosophers here. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is utilitarianism. Now, utilitarianism is quite different from either Aristotle or Kant, because utilitarianism tells us that um, the right action is the action that produces the greatest happiness and the greatest number. Now, this is a consequentialist <coughs> doctrine, not um, a doctrine based on intention or will. So whereas Kant believes that the only thing that's good in itself is the will, the choices, the intentions on which you act, the utilitarian thinks it's the consequences of your action that matter. So think, let's think about the nature of an action for a minute. Um, here, here's an act. Okay, Whatever that act is, it might be me scratching my nose because I've told, um, what's your name? I, Okay, I've told David that um, uh, if Mike isn't at the back today filming me, I'll let him know by scratching my nose, okay? And so I'm scratching my nose, and in effect, the scratching of the nose is a lie, isn't it? Because Mike is there. Uh, so um, this act could be a scratching of the nose. But of course, it's also a lie. Well, then it wouldn't be a lie, but it would be a scratching of the nose. <laughs> Actually, no, that, that's quite important, because... Um, oh, goodness, this is all me here. Oh, I do go on, don't I? <laughs> um, now I'll never find this bit again. Hang on. Um, if you think, think of... OK, think of me. I'm an object. Um, <coughs> I'm an object with many properties. There are many, many descriptions that pick out me uniquely, aren't there? So um, she's the only person in this room who's on the stage. Um, she's the uh, person who's director of studies in philosophy at OUDC. She's the person who's wearing a, um, a turquoise jumper. There's several other people here, but I'm the one on the stage wearing the turquoise jumper, etc. Do you see these are all uniquely identifying descriptions of me? So there are lots of different ways of getting to me, and the same thing is true of an action. Uh, actually, that's okay. Here's the class of nose scratchings. This one is a lie. <coughs> Okay, because this is the one where I'm looking at Dave and saying to tell him that Mike's not in the room. This one isn't. This is just the nose scratching. Okay, and this one is a is a. <coughs> I'm very bored with this <laughs> sort of move, um, and so on. Do you, do you see? So it can be a token thing that is also a lie. But when any token action, so here's a token action. It's an action of scratching the nose. The fact that it's an action means that it must have an intention, mustn't it? Okay? So if I come in and trip over the mat and you all laugh, I might think to myself, oh, that's interesting. I like making them laugh. I'll do it again next week. Um, so when I come in next week, I trip over the mat again. Now, the first one was unintentional, wasn't it? The second one is intentional. Um, so in order for it to be an action, something, it's got to be something you've chosen to do. 
is any action you haven't chosen to do is not an act for which you're morally responsible. Okay? There can be manslaughter rather than murder. You might be culpably guilty of manslaughter in that you really shouldn't have been cleaning your gun as it pointed at David um, and was loaded and so on. Um, so there's more or less guilt attached to manslaughter. But in order for it to be murder, there has to be an intention there. So you've got an intention, you've got an action, and you've got the consequences of an action. Okay, there are always going to be consequences of the action. So now David knows that Mike isn't there, he's going to go up and, and ask where Mike is or something like that, so that there's a consequence. So every act has an intention and a consequence. And Kant and Aristotle think that the moral evaluation of an action carried, goes on here, whereas utilitarianism thinks that an act can only be evaluated here. Okay, so it's not the intentions with which we act that make the act wrong, it's the consequences <coughs> of that act. So if I want to um, uh, take my dear old aunt out for tea, um, and as I take her out we cross the road and she's squashed by a bus, um, mm. the action I have performed has been wrong, even though in my intention was a good one. I'm going to feel guilty, you know, other people are going to, to worry about me and so on. What, what counts in making an action wrong is its consequences. And you can see one a huge advantage of this is that if we're looking at courts of law, it's pretty well only consequences that we can look at, isn't it? I have no way of getting to your intentions other than through your actions, including your linguistic actions. I mean, you might tell me that your intention was this, that, or the other. Um, so in a court of law, it's nearly always the consequences that matter more than the intention. Um, of course, I may want to get at the intention, but do you think that somebody could always intend well, but as a matter of fact, everything they do is wrong? So they intend to do the right thing, but they never actually succeed. I mean, wouldn't you be getting a bit suspicious? So, you know, this is the third aunt I've taken out <laughs> and squashed under a bus. Uh, and funny enough, they each left me money. <laughs> you know, I mean, what's going on here? Uh, so we look, at, we look at the consequences in order to determine the intentions, you know. And I tell, look, oh, God, it's happened again. Oh, my goodness me, I just, I meant to make her happy, etc. You're not going to believe me, are you? <laughs> so in a court of law, it's, it tends to be the consequences, not the... There's another nice thing about utilitarianism, and that is it gives us a bit of a decision procedure, doesn't it? So, I mean, Aristotle has us searching around for, for virtuous people, <coughs> and Kant has us searching our own uh, intuitions for what the moral law tells us to do on this occasion. Uh, but utilitarian is an inductive, inductive um, moral theory. It tells us that whatever action will produce the greatest happiness of the greatest number is the right action. So it looks as if it's much easier um, to, to work out what you should or shouldn't do. But do you think that's maybe misleading? Yes. Oh, you all do then. OK, let me just give you one example. Dropping the bomb on Hiroshima. Was that the right thing to do or not? Well, if you're a utilitarian, you think it was the right thing if dropping the bomb produced the greatest happiness, the greatest number, and that it wasn't the right thing if dropping the bomb didn't produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number. Now, what's the truth of the matter? Did dropping that bomb produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, or not? I mean, actually, we can give arguments, can't we, on both sides? There is a fact of the matter but the chances of our ever knowing that fact are virtually nil, aren't they? Um, so utilitarianism might seem to give us a, a very easy decision procedure, but actually it doesn't. And there are all sorts of other problems as well. I mean, do we, let, let's say that David is, is such a happy, cheery person, you know, he smiles all the time, he, it's very easy to make David happy, whereas Alison is a miserable old... <laughs> uh, 
And I can think, well, okay, I can produce much more happiness in this class by concentrating on David, uh, because he's very easy to make happy, and I, I can just ignore Alison, because she's, you know, nothing I can do is going to make her happy. And I'm not talking about average happiness or total happiness. What is happiness anyway? Um, so actually, utilitarianism is not as easy as it looks to, to um, execute or implement. Um, why you say that is the fact of the matter, uh, thinking about that particular example of spectrum, we cannot know what would happen if we the, hadn't got that bomb. We the fact we can't know doesn't mean there isn't a fact of the matter. Um, so, for example, are there three consecutive se sevens in the decimal expansion of pi? Um, or, excuse me a second, I'm just looking for something here. Something I can't find. Damn. Sorry? Yes, but the intention so doesn't matter. But happiness, how do you say happiness? Is the silly word you use there? Well, no, no. I mean, um, I mean, ending a war does make people happy, actually. Uh, and, of course, the alleviation of unhappiness produces happiness as well. Um, but, sorry, going back to your question. Um, you can't say that because we'll never know what the fact <coughs> was, therefore there wasn't a fact. I mean, the decimal expansion of pi is an infinite expansion. If there are no three consecutive sevens in the decimal expansion of pi, then we will never know this, ever. And we can know that in principle. It doesn't mean that it's a fact of the matter. Was there a tree yeah, here 20,000 years ago? Right here. I mean, there is a fact of that matter, isn't there? Yes. Will we ever know it? Yes, yes. because that's time past. But, uh, uh, the the clock is time future. And, and, and it wasn't that future. Well, it isn't that future. I mean, it's it been was, 50. It was being dropped. It was right. if we had ah, dropped well. It, the fact of what would happen then is in the future. We can never know that. Yes, but, but that's a different problem, um, because the fact is it was a long time ago, and we, there, probably, there is a fact of the matter now as to whether that, it produced more happiness than not. But the fact that the future we can't know about happiness is actually very interesting, isn't it? Because it does mean that when you actually act, you don't know what the consequences of your action will be. You can make a good, good guess, perhaps, but you can never be certain what the consequences of your action will be. So utilitarianism makes a very important distinction between the morality of an agent and the morality of an action. And whereas the morality of the action always depends on the consequences, the morality of an agent depends upon the fact that they act with the intention of producing the best consequences. Okay? So an immoral agent could carry out moral action Yes, uh, so if I um, go and plant a bomb in a, in a supermarket or something like that, and, and it's actually quite a small bomb, um, and as it goes off, it... it um, sorry, I'm trying... You can probably see where I'm going somewhere, but I can't. <laughs> um, it stops a major disaster from happening. Um, it causes something else. So my small bomb actually results in a lot more people being left alive than would otherwise have been left alive. Um, the consequences of what I've done have been good. But what I did was bad. <coughs> you see what I mean? My, I was bad for doing what I did, even though the consequences have been good. So for utilitarianism, you've got to make a distinction between the moral worth of the agent and the moral worth of the action that they performed. Um, uh, problems for utilitarianism. Um, one of the difficulties for utilitarianism is that it says that the action that produces the greatest happiness, the greatest number, is the right action. But there seem to be some very clear counterexamples to this. Um, for example, um, genocide. It looks as if utilitarianism could justify genocide. If you have a situation where the two of you down here, or the three of you down here, 
um, are a different race from us or a different something or other from us and we don't like them, do we? But there are not very many of them, are there? So let's just get rid of them. Okay, um, now that's produced the greatest happiness of the greatest number because, you know, there are not many of you to be happy, so your happiness doesn't really count. And we all wanted them dead. So that's produced the greatest happiness of the greatest number, hasn't it? That looks a bit worrying, to say the least. Now, it might be that some of us feel pretty outraged that these people have been shot. So, so four of you over here think that was really awful. So we can actually put your unhappiness with their unhappiness. But can we ever be sure that the unhappiness of those who are against genocide will outweigh the happiness of those who are for it? Can we be sure? No, it looks as if we can't. In which case, if you go for utilitarianism, it rather looks as if you're opening yourself to the possibility of justifying <coughs> genocide. And that's because to the utilitarian, a human right, the right to life, for example, is only a right on the um, understanding that your right to life isn't conflicting with the greatest happiness and the greatest number. Um, you have a right to life because on the whole it produces the greatest happiness and the greatest number to treat people as if they have a right to life. But if suddenly your right to life comes into conflict with the greatest happiness and the greatest number, then your right to life lapses. Okay? I, I have a duty to kill you if killing you will produce the greatest happiness and the greatest number. So there seem to be counterexamples to utilitarianism. Um, on the other hand, it's so incredibly useful. I mean, we're, we're actually using it in the National Health Service at the moment. Has, has anyone heard of Collies? Mm. So quality adjusted life years or something, policy that I've left something out there something. Quality adjusted <coughs> life years. When when a surgeon or a doctor is considering uh, some sort of intervention and he can only afford to do one of these perhaps rather than the other, you, you decide by looking at the quality of the so the number of life years that would be produced by this intervention, so for you it would be ten and for you it would be five. Um, and then you look at the quality of those years that, that you're producing. So you would have five actually pretty mediocre <coughs> years, whereas I can give you five really good ones. Of course, I've now made it very <coughs> difficult for myself. But, <laughs> but you see that, that you can look at qualities to, to give you some way, a uh, measure of which intervention you should do. And that's based very, very um, firmly on utilitarianism. So it's not just genocide. Well, do you remember the sailor who had to, the captain who had to shut off the oxygen in the engine room? Yes, but this would be the theory that justifies it. Well, utilitarianism did seem to justify shutting off the oxygen in the engine room, and it might justify war. But of course, Kant could also perhaps justify a war. And so could Aristotle, if, if the war seems to be the only thing that's treating others as ends in themselves, or, or the thing that the virtuous people would suggest. So it's not just utilitarianism that can justify war. E everyone can do that. But what utilitarianism can do can justify genocide, and, and it's not obvious the other theories can do that. So if you want to justify genocide, utilitarianism is probably your theory. Um, it makes it um, sound as if I've got a down on utilitarianism, which is absolutely not the case. I, I think that there are many ways of interpreting this. Um, in particular, I think that um, you might want to say that utilitarianism is a descriptive theory, not a prescriptive one. In other words, it's not telling us that this is what we should do, um, but that this is... There's somebody in there. No, it's, it, there's somebody who's gone into the and they're fiddling with knobs. <laughs> Let's see if the bike can turn it off. Has it gone? Stopped. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Right. A descriptive theory is just saying that when you do do the right action, 
it will work out that that was the action that produced the greatest happiness, the greatest number. Not that's what you should do. Because actually there's something wrong with saying it's prescriptive. I mean, I, I intend to go home tonight after I've been swimming, of course, um, and have a glass of wine. Um, now, I could actually go and work in the Oxfam shop or go and work <coughs> in the house for a bit or something like that, which would presumably make more people happy than me having my glass of wine at home. Um, should I be doing that? I mean, surely, I, actually, if what I'm supposed to be doing is producing the greatest happiness, the greatest number all the time, I'm going to get very tired. Um, so you might think it's not a prescriptive theory at all, but a descriptive one. So I've given you the, the bad news headlines about utilitarianism, but I promise you that there are ways of understanding this that make it much less simple than, than I've given the impression of. Can I say, I mean, I, it's probably a very naive view of moral philosophy, but I would have, it, it appears that maybe if we look back at child development and how children develop moral reasoning, that the thing that makes the crucial switch from whether it's externally imposed by consequences imposed by parents Mummy or something punish like me. that, and where, when it becomes internalised, is one of the major factors is the child's own development of empathy. Yeah. And that any moral philosophy that doesn't actually take into account that one of the major cornerstones of our own moral reasoning is our experience but of empathy. But these can all take empathy well, into account. I, because I, yes, utilitarianism is... It seems to sort of be a slight... Well, if I'm concerned for your happiness, I, I think that I've got to exercise... I mean, empathy is only a method of determining what others are feeling. I mean, if I put myself in your position, then I'm using empathy. But I'm using empathy to determine what's going to make you happy, or, or I'm imagining, you know, who's going to be affected by my action, how will they be affected by it. Or I'm thinking, what is it in this situation to treat you as an end in yourself? What would you choose if, you, if I was able to ask you? Again, I've got to use empathy. Um, well, I'm supposing children, the, the beginnings of empathy is simply actually experiencing the experience like the other person. It's not, it's not a reasoning or a rational process. Maybe that. not, but the fact is if, if all they're acting on, I mean, think back to what Aristotle said about um, you can be naturally benevolent. And I mean, children, if one child in the nursery starts screaming, the others are all going to come out in sympathy very quickly. <coughs> um, and if you cry in front of a child, the child gets very distressed. I mean, children are naturally empathetic, but they're, boy, they're not naturally moral. No, no, I mean, in, in order to become moral, they've got to learn what the right action is, they've got to learn that they've got to do the right action, and, and they've got to do it for the right reasons. So, empathy is the beginning of knowing that other people have feelings and experiences like you have internally. Yes, and then, then from there, children begin to see, if I do such and such to so and so, it will hurt, I don't like it. Yes, but I'm you're giving a psychological it. theory of yeah. morality, and I'm interested in the philosophical theory of morality. So in the same way, I can say, it, we can be interested in language, what is language, what is meaning, how do we manage to communicate with each other, that's a philosophical interest, or we can say, how does language develop in a child? That's a psychological theory, and... I'm teaching you philosophy. Yeah, I, I would have just thought that, that things like the law is just a sort of more sophisticated development of that. Um, you know, law and things like that. Otherwise, where does where does this law come from? Yeah. Okay. Um, Margaret, did you have a? I just had a question. Another question. Go on. Um, I was asking you. You were saying what a descriptive theory was. What is a prescriptive? Prescriptive theory tells you what you ought to do. So it's a prescription of so your you action, right not action. just a description. You, you obviously, obviously had to do the right action simply because um, you were told to do it or whatever. Or it was the only uh, No, you, do, you don't have to do it. It's just that utilitarianism, if it's a prescriptive mm -hmm. theory, it says you should produce grace toughness to grace number. Okay. If it's a descriptive theory, when you have done the right action, it will be the case that it does produce the greatest happiness, the greatest number, whatever your intention was in doing it. Yes. 
okay, in, including if you intended to do wrong. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to politics now because otherwise we're not going to get politics done. Okay, so that's ethical theory. And, and to go back to the developmental thing, of course empathy is important. Um, I think of empathy as actually, I call it charity, the principle of charity. Uh, I think there's very good reason to think that when we're trying to understand the physical world, we're constrained in all, all our thinking by something called the principle of the uniformity of nature. In other words, if we want to understand whether A causes B, we've got to see, that, see if we can get an A without a B, because if we can, that shows that A doesn't cause B. So we're assuming nature is uniform. But in the case of understanding each other, <coughs> We've got to use the principle of charity, which is a form of empathy, where if you say something that strikes me as mad, so you say P and I say, whoa, you know, it's obviously not P. Now, I could just dismiss you as stupid, um, but actually, if you're right, I'll be losing my opportunity to learn something. So the principle of charity tells you to, to always assume that the other person's error is less likely than your bad interpretation. Okay? So if you seem to be saying something mad, it's probably because I haven't understood you. And I need to ask you why are you saying that? Well, if I dismiss you as mad, then, then there's something wrong with me because you're a worthy collaborator in pursuit of truth. You're another rational animal. I'm doing wrong by dismissing you as stupid. Okay, um, moving on to politics. I'm going to talk about um, just one political issue um, because it's quite nice and central. The issue of distributive justice. How do we distribute the goods of society in such a way as it's done, to, as to do it justly, <coughs> fairly? Um, so in this country, we, we have a, an income tax regime. We also have a benefits regime. Where we redistribute wealth in various ways. And we presumably do this because we think that this is the just, most just way of distributing things like education, the vote, freedom of speech, etc. We try and equalise it, but we don't go for equality. We go for redistribution of the sort that we do. And I'm going to be talking about two philosophers, uh, John Rawls and Robert Nozick. Um, first, I'm going to talk about Rawls. 222. Yeah. How did that get in there? <laughs> Perhaps I should write to it. <laughs> I have no idea how that got there. <laughs> I have no idea. I, don't, I think he's still alive. <laughs> I'll have to look it up. Anyway, it's definitely not that. <laughs> or at least, if it is, I don't know. Okay. Rawls wrote a, a very influential book, hugely influential book, called The Theory of Justice. It's very big, it's very boring, I don't recommend it. Um, but it, it, is, um, it, it has some very interesting stuff in it. Um, and what Rawls sets out to do is to choose the principles of justice for a society. He says, what, what is it that, um, what are the principles on which goods should be distributed in such a way as to make it as just as possible. And the real hallmark of Rawls's um, originality was uh, something called the original position, which was his way of choosing the principles of justice. This is how he did it. The original position is a position uh, where people of a certain kind are put in a certain position and asked to decide on the rules by which justice should be, uh, by which goods should be distributed. And the people are like this. They're rational, they're self-interested, okay, so, so they're not stupid, they, they care about themselves, um, but they, they also, you know, they're quite happy to be kind to other people. They're also risk averse. They, they don't really want to put themselves into a, into a difficult position. They don't want to take risks. Um, and the original position that they're, sorry, the position they're put in is behind the veil of ignorance. Now, the veil of ignorance means that you don't know anything about yourself. 
So you don't know whether you're male or female. You don't know whether you're old or young. You don't know whether you're rich or poor, <coughs> black or white, um, intelligent or stupid, uh, ill or fit. OK, you know nothing about yourself. You could be any of these things. OK? Um, the only th knowledge you have is the thin theory of good, Rawls calls it. And what the thin theory of good is, it tells you um, things like uh, human beings need warmth, they need comfort, they need um, a certain amount of property over which they have autonomy. Um, humans gestate for nine months. So you, ha you have a basic <laughs> physiological, psychological, political, economic facts about human beings, but you don't know anything about you. And now you've got to decide what the principles of justice should be. And what Rawls thinks is that because you're behind the veil of ignorance, you're forced to be fair. Okay? You don't know whether you're well or sick, so you're not going to um, make the setup such that people who are sick are going to be discriminated against, because that might be you. You don't know whether you're rich or poor, so you're not going to give the rich everything and leave the poor with nothing, because you <coughs> might be poor. You're not going to be, uh, you don't know whether you're black or white, so you're not going to set up systems so that black people are discriminated against or white people are discriminated mm -hmm. against, because you don't know who you are. Ditto with female, ditto with, do you see what I mean? You, because you don't know who you are, your self-interest is not going to work for any particular type of person. Your self-interest is going to work on behalf of anyone, or rather everyone, if you like. Clever, isn't it? Um, good way of doing it. Um, and Rawls thinks that the two principles of justice that he believes will come out of this pr process are these two. Um, everyone's entitled to maximum liberty compatible with equal liberty for all. Um, okay, so actually he's a libertarian. <coughs> he he uh, is a consequentialist. But whereas the utilitarian will put happiness as the sun and moon and as the thing to, we all want, uh, he puts liberty there. It's liberty that's the most important thing. <laughs> And you could say we want equality, things should be distributed equally, but if you do that, you're, you're not taking into account of the fact that we're not given an equal distribution to start with, are we? Um, you know, if I'm ill, I possibly need more goods than you need because you're fit. So he says that inequalities are permitted, but only when they make the worse off better off. Okay, so those are the two principles of justice. So to evaluate rules, you've got to think, OK, what do we think of the original position in the first place? And what do we think of the principles of justice that come out of it? I mean, we, we might think we might dismiss the original position. It's not a good idea. Or we might dismiss the, the principles of justice that come out. Um, and I'll say just a little something. On the original position, one important thing you've got to work out is just which information goes where, um, behind the veil of ignorance or in the thin theory of good. Let's say that you believe that um, women are very emotional, okay, and that therefore they shouldn't be allowed to fly planes. Um, now, do you put women are very emotional <coughs> into the thin theory of good, because this is a fact about half the human race, and just as you put in, it's women who have babies, because it would be very important. That was in the thin theory of good, wouldn't it? Um, do you put women are emotional in there, or do you put that in the behind the veil of ignorance? So your decision about where you put um, various bits of information is actually going to, to so garbage in, garbage out, in effect, isn't it? So. Um, somebody in South Africa might have put all sorts of things about black people into the thin theory of goods that we would think probably belong in the behind the veil of ignorance. Um, people 200 years ago would have put a lot of facts about women into the thin theory of good that we think ought to be behind the veil of ignorance. So, so surely, isn't the whole thing just question begging? Um, that we're going to put into the veil of ignorance all the things, you know, all our prejudices are going to be 
exercised simply in the division of where we put things. That's one thing. There's another thing, problem we might think, and that's, um, okay, inequalities are permitted when they make the worse off better off. Well, okay, um, let's say that I've got something I can do that in this room, you're the worse off, sorry, you're doing really badly today, I'm afraid. You're the worse off, we're the best off, um, and I can do something that's going to make us a lot better off. Okay, I can really do something. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to shift them by so much as a, a halfpenny. Okay, now this is ruled out. We can't do that because this is an inequality that isn't making the worse off better off. On the other hand, um, I could do it if I make them just half a penny better off. We could up ours by just a tiny little bit or something like that. Um, so there seems to be something of a politics of envy um, that could work in here um, quite worryingly um, because it might prevent changes that would make an awful lot of people better off but would be prevented just because it doesn't make the worse off better off. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about the rules. But that, that's a, a very quick romp through distributive justice according to the theory of justice and the original position is the key thing in that point and of that it's the original position and the thin theory of good that are important. Mm. And now finally I'm going to go on to Nozick. Nozick um, holds a Lockean, John Locke, English philosopher, uh, property theory. Um, what that says in effect is, is that you own um, the labour of your own body and everything with which you mix that labour. Now that's actually, uh, this theory of property is, is, underpins the American Constitution. It also underpins much of our law. I mean, for example, there was a time when um, you were allowed to um, enclose all the lands that you and your family could plough between sunrise and sunset. And one thing that was rather fair about this is if you, if you were very strong and you had a family of lusty sons who could get up there and plough a lot of land, then you could enclose a lot of that land between sunrise and sunset, but you could also work it you know, with all these sons, and, and what's more, you'd eat it too. Um, whereas if, if you and your um, little old mother were tilling the land, <coughs> you know, you couldn't get much done, but on the other hand, you wouldn't need that much either, would you? Um, so that, that was the idea between you, you um, can own what you mix your labour with. Big problems, though. I mean, somebody pointed out that if I empty a wine glass into the sea, have I lost my wine or gains of the sea? <laughs> um, if I'm tilling the lands, do I also get to own the mineral rights under the land or just the topsoil? Um, so there are big theories. Another big theory, Locke specified, and so does Nosey, <coughs> that you've got to leave as good and as much behind for people who come after you. And the trouble with this is it can zip back. If there are ten apples, then... You take one, you take one, you take one, you take one. But when it gets to the tenth, I can't take it because I'm not leaving as good and as much behind. But if I can't take it, neither can the ninth person or the eighth person or the seventh person or the sixth person. Or, and it looks as if um, property can't be owned at all, if you think of the zip back <coughs> principle. So there are problems with the Lockean property theory, which underpins Nozick's theory. But one of the big things that he claims is that taxation is forced labour. And his argument for this, um, he talks about Wilt Chamberlain, who was a basketball player. Now, Wilt is a wonderful basketball player. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, and you all have a certain number of holdings, OK? You've got a bit of money. Let's say we've all got equal amount of money, and so is Wilt. We've all, everyone, including Wilt, has the same amount of money. But Wilt has this talent, OK? But he says, I'm only going to exercise this talent if you pay me. And we all say, that's all right, we'll pay you. We'll give you an extra 25 cents for playing basketball. Um, well, Wilt does play basketball. He ends up richer than the rest of us. Okay. Um, now, Nozick says, that's fair. You all chose to give him the extra 25 cents. 
He chose to exercise his talents. He didn't have to work like that. Um, and his unequal wealth is owned by him. If you now take 25% of that away in taxation, you're, in effect, you're forcing him to work for 25% of the time. I mean, for the hour and a half I've been lecturing here, 22% of that, I think, uh, is going to be taken away from me. Yeah, that's wicked. What, <laughs> should, shouldn't I be left with that 25%? We could then, um, I mean, we could have private medicine, private education, toll roads and so on. Why should the state take that money away and spend it on things that I don't know? I don't have any children. Why should I spend money on education? I don't drive. Why should I spend money on, ro on roads? Um, so the conflict between liberty and equality, the only way, says Nozick, of um, avoiding that link is you either have to interfere with Wilt's ability to choose whether or not to exercise his talents. You've got to make him exercise his talents for no extra money. Um, or you've got to stop you from choosing to spend your money freely. Okay, you can't spend it all on Wilt. Either way, there's a conflict between liberty and equality, um, and that, says Nozick, is, is the key problem for all liberal theories of distributive justice. What do you think of that as a theory? Rubbish, says someone. <laughs> Why? Um, well, I think it, it goes against my feeling of fairness. Uh, well, hang on, what's unfair here? Well, if we're talking about distributive, Mm -hmm. Justice. Um, choosing to give to the talented or to the private, this, that, and the other, uh, is going to perpetuate inequalities. Whereas taxation, as we understand it, should, I agree there are the faults of it, but should in theory even us out. Um, but but Nozick would say that um, there's nothing uneven about this taxation. If we're starting from, uh, sorry, about um, private use, whoa, sorry, I've not tried to lean on that. Um, if we've all started with equality, okay, um, I don't have children um, and I don't have uh, a car, but I do like swimming occasionally. Um, I would like to spend my money on decent leisure facilities, um, you know, the National Trust, things like that. You have a car, you would, what, you would be prepared to pay to have toll roads put up, so private roads. <coughs> Any of you uh, who might get sick, which is probably all of us, would want to pay for private insurance to make sure that we um, had hospitals available when we did it. So it's not that there wouldn't be hospitals. But we don't all start out well, that's, but that's exactly his point. It's, it's, his point is that as we don't start out equal, um, and you want to encourage everyone to use their talents, if you're silly enough to, to make it, um, to stop them from using their talents by taxing them, then you're going to lose, they're not going to use those talents. I mean, in, in some ways you can see that this happens. If taxation is set too high, the, the people with talent are going to leave the country and not pay the tax. I mean, it's quite, it's crucial, isn't it, to set the taxation level so that you don't lose the people who, um, because there is this conflict. So it's not that he's saying there shouldn't be any taxation, but he's saying that if you, taxation is forced labour and therefore you don't want too much of it. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing you might say is, is that if you tax people, if, sorry, if you don't tax people at all, um, there are some people who are going to fall out of the net. They, you might say there has to be a safety net of some kind. Nozick wouldn't even accept that. Um, he thinks that, uh, very importantly, charity must be supported in a big way. So um, it must be uh, voluntary giving becomes very important in a society where there is very little taxation, very low taxation. And I'm sure that must How be true. How does he encourage that? Well, in schools and in... Uh, I mean, there are, there are ways of encouraging giving. I mean, they do it in America very much better mm -hmm. than they do it here. But you've left work after that, too. You've left work after that, too. I mean, work is a 
He doesn't like playing basketball. He must. Yeah, this is very bad. Yeah, but it's not just that. Yeah, it's not just that. Yeah, but 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 it's not just that. Yeah, um, and in order to, to get liberty, you cannot assume equality will follow, because it won't. Um, there's a, there's a, a key conflict between liberty and equality, rather like truth and kindness. Georgia? Um, the way it's written, though, Sorry. the way that those points are made, and I think obviously that's a very small part of, of the theory. A very small yeah. part of the theory. <laughs> Can I assume that it isn't just about money? Because those points seem to be more about no. being paid for something but, and taxation, but equality no. isn't about No, distributive money, justice is about the goods in society. Um, so it, it includes things like the boat, education, <coughs> roads, hospitals, health care, <coughs> um, everything of that kind. Um, but of course... Um, given the way our societies are as a matter of fact set up, of course it's money that, that pays for all these things and so it does tend to come down to money because there's no re redistributive mechanism in society, then surely that can't be right. Um, there, there's got to be something wrong with that. So surely there ought to be some basic redistributive mechanism to at least ensure that everybody has some property, however much is needed to be autonomous, if, if being autonomous is, is the most important thing. Yeah? It seems likely that even the philosophers But he's a libertarian, he's not just a conservative. Well, okay. So is it possible to be a philosopher without having a political position? Oh yes. I, I mean, I mean uh, philosophers are people. <laughs> um, I mean, one would hope that their political positions are rather more thought out than those of non-philosophers, but, but I'm afraid it isn't necessarily so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you can be a philosopher with a political position. Roger Scruton, for example, is a rather famous philosopher with a rather famous political position. Um, and there are lots of philosophers who, who are political skeptics as well. So you can go either way on that one. Anyone else? Can I go back to Aristotle's virtuous people? Um, I'm a little bit suspicious of them. It's very hard to find somebody going to be equally reliable on all these matters. I mean, they uh, ask them, uh, for advice on uh, say, um, the code uh, when you don't know that they have filed with the 
somebody who's virtuous would be virtuous about everything, although he would admit that they can get it wrong. I think what I mean is that our decisions um, and our hard decisions are shaped by our values. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily our decisions. Yes, but uh, I mean, one thing you would want to do if you, if you were a wise and virtuous person is to look at the problem as objectively as possible. Um, I mean, you would try not to let these... And also, you might say, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is something on which I don't want to advise you because I know that it, I'm going to be biased. Um, and I know that it's wrong to be biased, therefore, this is not a, an issue on which I want to be consulted. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable and consistent with being virtuous. But perhaps a few people more will say that. Uh, two more very quick ones. One here and one here. is coming back actually a little bit to this. Does it, does it not involve sort of um, absolute virtue and an absolute right? Actually, all the theories they that do. we've looked at here are absolutist theories. Yes. Um, uh,